Welcome to the Theology Podcast. It's great to have you with us today. I'm C.R. Wiley. I'm a pastor. I serve a church in the Pacific Northwest, and I've written a number of things, and I'm working on a number of things. Uh, one of the things I'm working on is a book on resisting totalitarianism, and I'm a senior editor for Touchstone Magazine. That's enough about me. How about you, Glenn? I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm a retired history professor specializing in the Reformation. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, Ministry Associated Reflections Ministries, and I have my own 501c3 called Every Square Inch Ministries. Super, super. All right, Tom, introduce yourself and take us into the subject of the day. All right, I'm Tom Price. I teach uh, theology, Christian ethics, philosophy, and a few other things. Uh, one of the places is Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. So the topic today is going to pivot quite a bit off of the topic from last week. Um, we're on a Lewis theme, I think, because we are going to Lewis land <laughs> in Oxford here soon. So there's nothing wrong with kind of getting our minds wrapped around uh, his thinking and material um, in some way. And Lewis is one of those who I think, you know, most of us would agree, you could take one quote and build an article or a book or a show out of it, and I'll be building a show out of a quote as well. And so there's kind of a twofold uh, theme in in the one topic, um, and it has to do with, in some sense, the rich sacramental vision of reality that Lewis has, place of imagination, like we talked last time, but the way in which past writers or artists or creators, if you will, um, have a significant role in shaping, forming, extending us. um, And why Lewis saw this as profound and as Christians, why we should think it profound. The theme related to that, of course, is why is it that sometimes, um, especially, you know, those evangelicals in the modern world who like to create something like, you know, kind of pure flicks rather than watch Netflix, uh, create something that on one level has a kind of moral purity to it, but aesthetically and metaphysically, it is just dead flat and suffocating and isn't Christian in any real sense of the word. It's just as naturalist or, <laughs> or the depths of meaning are so, you know, so taken out of it. Um, I was trying to think of, uh, Say, Tom, before you go much further with that, I'd like to just make a a, a comment on that. So anyone who uh, is familiar with, say, pop evangelical culture from the 70s, 80s, 90s, remembers a kind of plastic character to what was provided. And the main thing that, you know, all of the media was... was designed to do was to evangelize. Yeah. So it, everything served that purpose. But there was nothing really that came out of it that was terribly uh, rich or deep or uh, helpful or or captured the imagination to tie into what we talked about last week. The problem with Hollywood today is they've actually taken that and applied that approach to wokeism. They, <laughs> they ruin everything. <laughs> <laughs> they can't tell a decent story anymore. Yeah. It's almost like they said, "Okay, if Christians Christians if Christians can ruin things, we can ruin them even worse." Worse. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ruin the way they ruin. But th- but I think there is something here that Lewis is going to tune into about reading even the pagan past um, that understands that there can be created works of art, literature, and the like, that capture something of the richer Christian understanding of reality and beauty, even if the story it tells may have some kind of muddled ethic around it. We've all heard a great piece of even pop music sometimes by some artist This is just a depraved reprobate who you can't even think can utter sometimes two sentences, and yet they put together some amazing, you know, melody with chords and the like that just just has a way of getting a hold of something. And how in the world can that be, right? Or, you know, you, you'll you read somebody who, you know, Borges or, or some figure like that who just has a, a, just a rich literary understanding and can pull out connections and truths. I mean, read, 
he has that one essay, Borges, and I don't remember if it was his fictions or I don't remember what collection it is, where you think he's telling the whole story of Jesus the whole time. And it ends up being a story about Judas. And just the play and the, 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 the reversals are just stunning ways of, of reading the episode. Again, why, why can they do this and get a hold of something, even though on one level, maybe just the moral or the, the puritanical, they're off-centered. And can that be a value? So I'm going to return to that, but I'm going to start with a quote from Lewis. Actually, Tom, be, before yeah. you, you, you it, it's interesting that you should talk about how um, sort of the puritanical thing here mm -hmm. uh, in connection with, with the other, because what you see happening is both sides. Yeah. You know, you, you've got a kind of puritanical approach to this, yeah. which we see in arguably pure flicks, but you yeah. also see, interestingly enough, in a lot of the woke stuff. Yes. Yeah. But then you've got the other side as well. Both of them, you, you, they, you've got it occurring on both sides. Yeah, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to what, what happens when sometimes we get the Lewis point right, but we go wrong with it. I, I got an episode of that too. So okay. we got an episode. <laughs> so I'm going to start with a quote from the experiment. Uh, Lewis is an experiment in criticism, uh, which is worth reading for anyone out there who has not. And this is actually at the very end of the book, um, page 140 for those working with this edition. Um, and Lewis begins, those of us who have been true readers all our life seldom fully realize the enormous extension of our being, which we owe to authors. Um, I think Richard Dawkins is just discovering this about Christian culture. But anyway, we realize it best when we talk about an unliterary friend. He may be full of goodness, right, and good sense, but he inhabits a tiny world. Pure flicks, right? Goodness, good sense, tiny world. In it, we should, be, we should be suffocated. The man who is connected to be only himself and therefore less a self is in prison. My own eyes are not enough for me. I will see through those of others. Reality, even seen through the eyes of many, is not enough. I will see what others have invented. Even the eyes of all humanity are not enough. I regret that the brutes cannot write books. Very gladly would I learn what face things present to a mouse or a bee. More gladly still would I receive the olfactory world charged with all the information and emotion it carries for a dog. But literary experience heals the wound without undermining the privilege of individuality. There are mass emotions which heal the world, but they destroy the privilege. In them, our separate selves are pooled and we sink back into sub-individuality. But in reading great literature, I become a thousand men and yet become my, remain myself. Like the night sky in the Greek poem, I see with a myriad eyes, but it is still I who see. Here, as in worship, in love, in moral action, and in knowing, I transcend myself and am never more myself than when I do. That's a beautiful quote. I, it reminds me of Mr. Bultitude. Uh, in, yeah. Because uh, there's, a, there's a scene in uh, That Hideous Strength. So this is a bear. He's a friendly yeah. bear. He's come to live with the community at St. Anne's, and he's kind of a pet, but more than that, a pet. But there's a point at which Lewis enters his mind and describes the world from Mr. Bultitude's perspective. And it was really a marvelous account. I mean, I can actually imagine that that's pretty much how a bear experiences reality. <laughs> <laughs> I think Thomas Nagels would have to rewrite his, his book. He had a famous article, What It's Like to Be a Bat, and that we can never experience it. But he, he obviously hasn't met Lewis. <laughs> well, that, that's an important point. I, I, yeah, there, we, we live in a world where because we've lost touch with the Lagos, we really do think that uh, each individual mind is utterly alien to the other. This yeah. is H.P. Lovecraft's whole premise behind cosmicism and his horror yeah. fiction. Uh, you know, he recoiled from the idea of the Lagos. Yeah. Um, and the idea that, you know, there is a way, there is, there's a measure to which in which or with which we can uh, sympathize with yeah. other creatures. Um, 
not just other human beings. But of course, you know, when it comes to the radical postmodern vision, you can't even sympathize with another human being. You know, yeah. it's a black thing. You wouldn't understand all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's you know, right. You know, mm -hmm. when, when you actually extend this to animals, it gets really interesting. A dog's hearing is 800 times as acute as our hearing is, and that's its second best sense. <laughs> you know, or, you know, we have three kinds of cones in our eyes that allow us to distinguish color. <laughs> the mantis shrimp has 14. What is it seeing? That, it, I mean, you, you can't even imagine what that, what that world is like. Well, well, it's interesting you mentioned these kind of creatures because, again, the medievals like their bestiaries, right? And mm -hmm. Lewis, of course, picks up on this and adds that into, you know, Nar the Narnia stories, his own way of taking it. Um, but at first, it is kind of a way of classifying and talking about kind of off-the-surface red behaviors that distinguish the different creatures. But then it starts to recognize that there's a surplus of meaning. You can start reading them like a, a meaning text the same way you can read creation and, and the scriptures, right? And so we may, not, you know, we may not be a part of that imaginative world to make sense of those things and would see it as kind of way out there. But there, there definitely is something to which other creatures have things because they're creatures and manifest being, and we're beings and have a certain way of discerning intelligibility and meaning from it that we can relate in some ways. Yes, it's always as a human relating to these things, but it doesn't make these things, and I think this is in a way similar to Lewis's point, we transcend ourselves and come into our own more fully by this interconnected difference, meaning, and, and you know, relationality. It's very, it's very rich. It's a very connected view of creation. I, I've only heard the last part of that quote before. You yeah. know, basically that, you know, I can I can be a thousand people and still be myself. Something, you know, the, uh, to that effect. But I, I hadn't really considered... I was thinking about that only in terms of literature. I hadn't yeah. really considered Lewis's push in the other direction to imaginatively entering into creation in a in a different way it's in, that that it's that's fascinating <laughs> that's a fascinating take in itself i mean i think some of the ways in which some of these you've talked about in the last show the way there's a current turn to imaginative apologetic because the old kind of hard rationalism oversold itself it basically it basically made reason larger than the god of reason right and god had to fit in the dock right rather than God being the source of all truth, reason, and intelligibility, and meaning. And therefore, reason is, is holistic with all these other things. And so, so what you end up having is a different way in which you understand your connectedness to the rest of creation. And so with St. Augustine and the like, you would see creation is, is a sign that can meaningfully be read. In other words, things have their own natures. But those natures for themselves and of themselves are not how we're to understand them fundamentally. That's just the stepping stone. They point in a lot of directions and ultimately towards the source of things to be the illuminative light that sheds light on all of those meanings. So you have all kinds of things that are in the world. You have you know, a tree that has wood that can be all these different kinds of things. So its symbolic range is wide. Its meaning base is, is far. But if you don't have a capacity to enter into an imaginative relationship and meaning relationship with these things, how would you know what those things can be for and done with them? Yeah, and this re this reminds me that that very illustration reminds me of something in Wendell Berry that's pretty uh, powerful. He talks about a stand of trees on a farmer's land hmm. and to that particular farmer, he's not saying this is necessarily how farmers think, but he's saying to this particular farmer, it represents nothing but board linear feet. In mm -hmm. other words, it has no more significance than what he can uh, translate it into uh, in terms of trade and economic mm -hmm. uh, you know, uses. It's just yeah. basically material for building houses or making paper or whatever. 
Uh, it doesn't have anything uh, significant to it beyond that. So, what would be some other things? So, you know, even a even a uh, an unimaginative farmer, and in my experience, farmers can be very imaginative. But let's just say we're dealing with a, a farmer who's uh, a bit uh, of a autist autistic person, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but even that sort of person can say, "Well, this stand of trees is something I need to." to uh, preserve for my children, Hmm. Uh, not just because they need resources like a 401k or, you know, stock, but because uh, it's our family land. And this has always been part of the family land. And and I grew up, you know, walking through these woods. They can grow up walking through these woods. That gives us something that we share in common. So even at a just purely human level, there's more to it than just cash value. But of course, if you think about this in the biggest framework of all, the metaphysical, I mean, there's so much significance to the stand of trees. You might be afraid to turn it into board linear feet. <laughs> you get my drift. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think it's in uh, Dawn Treader. I I'm, I'm, may not have the right one. Um, I think it's Eustace meets a star. and. He says to the star, in our world, stars are big flaming balls of gas. And the star replies, that's not the case. That's not what the star is. That's what the star is made of. Even in your world, that's not what a star is. So, you know, that, that again, this issue of meaning, this issue of significance, it's not just what it's made of. It's... That's it. It's very interesting. I guess this could kind of step into the next next fact because it, your point there is similar to I don't know. Have you seen uh, Terrence uh, Malick's The Tree of Life, the film? Yeah. So this this film, of course, is I mean, whatever. It, it it's very profound existentially. It has an aesthetic, I think, a metaphysical dimension to it that I think you know nothing on you know pure flicks is is going to capture. Um, and it tells sort of the story in the 1950s of, I think it's the 50s. I think it's similar to his upbringing. I don't know how it's connected to him exactly. A Catholic family growing up, um, three brothers uh, in the South, and, you know, the hardships they face. And, if, you know, and is eventually it, is it, it's going to be— Doesn't huh? Brad Pitt play the father? Is, am I remembering Brad that correctly? Brad Pitt plays the father, and Sean Penn plays the oldest son when he grows up, and he who seals with a lot of guilt because he kind of bullied his younger brother who ends up dying, I think, in Vietnam. And and but the the start of the film all the way through it it starts with kind of the you know reflecting on his Catholic upbringing. Say you know uh, one of our teachers growing up said all of reality is flooded through with either nature or grace, and it is a re- wrestling through the nature and grace metaphysic through his father who on the one hand is 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 trying through nature to train the boys how to deal with the world and its brokenness, to be tough. He's punching the kids, having them punch them back. Then you have the mother who is trying to to nurture them, kind of representing grace in this picture, although it goes back and forth, where she eventually is the one who has to give the old, the, the younger son back to God before the oldest brother can forgive himself. It's, it's really profound work. But all through it, you have this thing, Glenn, moving to those images of the first moments of creation, and they keep going back to Job. Where were you when the foundations were laid? So here is someone who I, I don't think Malik embraces the faith still. I, I think I, I think he's kind of one of these Buddhist types. I don't, I don't know his own his own personal background now, but definitely got a hold of the metaphysic and aesthetic vision of the Christian faith and something of its, of its moral wrestlings with the question of suffering. You know, the father will say, look, I've tithed all my life. I can't get ahead of my job. I lose my job. I lose my house. My family loses that history in that place. And, and he's trying to wrestle with what does it mean to be faithful and do all the right things? And, and the, uh, yeah, you know, so marvelous... all these questions are raised that you don't get in other kinds of Yeah, there's family. a marvelous scene where uh, he's a corp- in a corporation and um, he's trying to break free. Yeah, he's got an idea that is his own idea. Yeah, but because he had been in the employ of the corporation, it claimed that it was its property, and he goes to court to fight with the corporation 
for ownership of this idea and he loses. Yeah. And it's a crushing scene. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if there's anything I w- that I could point to that would illustrate um, sort of the downside of the corporate economy, we're all, we're all aware of the upsides. But the downside, it, yeah. particularly in this, re- in this respect, this was his idea. Uh, my, it reminded me of my own father-in-law, who uh, was the guy who designed the filament that is now used in all of the big wind turbine blades that we see all over the world. Yeah. You know what he got? A plaque. Uh. Yeah, well, this, in a way, this talks about, it shows at the end, it shows, I mean, not the end, but through the movie, as Sean Penn's character, the older brother, is has risen to success. They show him with these huge corporate, you know, corporate level, looking over these huge buildings that the modern world has presented, and yet he's contemplating suicide because he can't get past until he understands his mother can, can, can actually return back to God in grace the you know the the son that was lost he can't get past it but when he finally experiences her doing that he notices and sees all of his family on a shore definitely representative of heaven and united again and he's able to go back but the meaning was completely flushed out of his existence until that spiritual resolution happened and and you don't get this and this is kind of what lewis is talking about is there is literature. He can read D.H. Lawrence, who has some kind of morally questionable characters and displays, but also find there something of experience in life to which is a set of eyes worth seeing through. And through seeing through our connectedness to other sacraments in the world, if you want to put it that way, broken or not, we are able to um, actually receive the gift character of other things, broken or not, and be enhanced by that. It is a grace. Um, it, why are there other things? I mean, think of the garden. You know, uh, uh, Chris's favorite hymn, of course, is in the garden of Lone. <laughs> that's, that's a joke, people. But, but if you notice, being in the garden of Lone alone wasn't good. <laughs> Adam was still lonely, right? There were all kinds of gifts there, but until there was a certain kind of gift that is analogous but distinct, it is only then that Adam, too, can come to himself. And notice the language of Adam when he receives Eve, right? Different, complementary. That difference in complementary, it allows him also to see himself for the first time. What does he say? Bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. I can see myself now. I couldn't see myself anywhere else. So reading others and, and the differences, even with the brokenness or not, is a way of seeing and receiving something of ourselves, all the while transcending ourselves and our connectedness to a creation. And I think Lewis gets that. You don't get lost in the collective. You actually come to, you know, this is, he, he's kind of, he's drawing off an analogy we use in theology when we talk about the human being as an image bearer of God. The more we conform to Christ likeness, the more we're God-like, guess what? The more distinct we are as well. The more we come into our own. That's why scripture will use the language, you know, that your identity now is in Christ, but you don't even know really who or what you are until when he comes back, you will see yourself in a sense more fully as well, right? So there is a sense in we're made to, as image bearers, to transcend ourselves in order to really come to our own perfection. And so- So, so related to this, Tom, I, I think about an experience I had years ago when I was in graduate school reading Montaigne. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, he's a very gifted essayist and really a, I think, if you want to understand the French, he's <laughs> one of the people that I would point you to. <laughs> and there are many things about him that I don't like. Yeah. But when I'd read him, I kind of sensed that my awareness was growing. Yeah. He had that kind of effect on me. He and I, I suppose that's the thing to, to say. You don't have to agree with everything that a writer says in order to in, be enriched by reading yeah. that person. Yeah. Mont- Montaigne is actually an interesting one in this in this regard because you, you said he's a great essayist. He's the guy who invented the literary form, the essay. He, in, uh, yeah. You know, essay means an attempt in French to try yeah. something. Um, and what he was trying to do 
was explore himself. He was trying to do, to look at his own thinking and, and pondering and all of that and, and express that. What, what What's going on? What does he really think about these different things? Yeah. And, and, and so what you see in Montaigne is a person who is very self-consciously trying to provide for himself perhaps, but definitely for the reader, that experience that Lewis talks about. That you through him, you get through his essays, you get access to a totally different person who yeah. is thinking differently. You're you're exploring his thought and things like that in in a um in a way that, like I said, he very much intentionally tried to do that. And and there is kind of a I mean, it takes a strong ability, not simply to empathize, but it takes a strong humility. And I, I think one of the things to keep in mind why Lewis does this sort of thing, I mean, part of it was his own process in coming to faith, but Lewis needed some ground clearing. Um, and just like Karl Barth, even, even when you talk about him being kind of anti-apologetics, his Romans commentary was in a lot of ways a kind of technique in ground clearing, right? Clear the ground of all the things that we we need to almost say something, almost get rid of in order to start thinking right again. And so what he, what Lewis is dealing with, of course, is a flattened kind of modernism and dry rationalism or I- empiricism in which science is the only, has the only access to truth or you just have kind of moralism, you know? And, and so one of the things is he saw himself as captured by a kind of bad kind of enchantment, right? That there was a spell over him and the whole culture that needed to be broken. And so the George McDonald's of the world and these different figures, even before he came to faith, had to br- had, were part of breaking that spell, getting rid of his presentism and all of his biases, if you will, towards the present world and its narrowness, right? Th- that's where he talks about being small-worlded. And that opened him up. So at first he was, you know, he was an idealist for a long time. He thought everything was consciousness when he kind of first flipped from being a strict materialist to kind of following the Barfield and, and McDonald line. And it was only through the incarnation and Tolkien and the like, these, this process. And so reading these figures, a lot of which weren't even Christian, but were ones that helped break the spell were significant for his own conversion and coming to faith. There were avenues that God used in a world that, like music or different things, like, well, think of it this way. What about St. Augustine's conversion, right? Here's a little girl, the the kids are singing a song, basically, a kid's song, right? Open the books or read the book or what have you. And he hears in it God telling him to open the scripture, (laughs) right? Tell me me how that one works out, (laughs) you know? But but here you go. One is the intended thing, but also the sign character and its instrumental capacity to communicate, um, you know, revelation. And so you, you have this this richness. Um, but one of the things that what happens when this goes wrong? Um, I'll give you an example. I was reading some some one of these young kind of postmodern, trying to be the kind of postmodern trendy. Uh, evangelical types, I imagine. And so they wrote this little substack, and basically wanted to, they, they were right on this point, but they wanted to take it and to basically defend a place for drag shows, transgender drag shows, right? Or whatever they're called, I don't even know. So follow this out. So he is correct in his little substack where he begins to say that we tend to follow moralism. And they used the episode at St. Patrick's to say, look, the reason why the drag show that was, they had a drag show apparently at St. Patrick's as well. The reason that was bad was not bad for drag shows per se, right? But because of the kind of context that the people put it in. This is so postmodern, right? And so it was, it was, it was kind of, uh, you know, bad positioning, if you will, <laughs> Um, but, bec- but there are, there is something, according to this person, in the whole drag genre that is salvageable as a good that we can learn from, just like you can learn from D.H. Lawrence or you can learn from Ovid, where they have some pornographic scenes, but great literary writing. 
And I think this is exactly where one goes wrong. And, and to, I think you guys know, uh, what is his name? Uh, Thaddeus, uh, over at Imaginative Conservative, um, Thaddeus uh, Kaczynski. He, he, sent a li- he sent a little note back saying, that's the thinking of the Antichrist. And, uh, but I think he, was, he, actually was, he actually was right on track because this is, this is the problem here. In the drag genre, which is a subversive of not simply the Enlightenment marginalization of things, but also the Christian moral order, which is not simple moralism, but is grounded in creation, male and female. And while they may be trying to subvert certain stereotypes, they are also trying to indirectly reject the good created order and, and, and ways in which that's expressed. It isn't the same thing. And what you get in Terence Malick is not a try, an attempt to subvert it. It's an attempt to enter the profundities versus this kind of thing where you are trying legitimately to war in some way in the, your little territory against the created moral order. So I don't think every episode for Lewis, I mean, Lewis wouldn't say, you know what? The photographer of a pornographic movie is a great photographer. So you should watch pornography for the sake of being able to watch a good, you know, filmmaker. I mean, that's not what Lewis is saying here. But what he's saying here is that there is there are literary works and there are things where maybe the character is less or the person writing it is a bad character. But there are echoes of truth, beauty, and goodness that permeate that, that are worth retrieving in these, you know, special cases. Um, so do you, where, remember, do you remember uh, Veritatis Splendor by uh, Pope John Paul II? Yes, yep. So in that, he uh, marvelously laid out an, uh, uh, or introduced me to an idea that I had never to that point given any thought to, and that was that some, the reason why some things are intrinsically evil is because they cannot be ordered to the glory of God. Yeah, there is no way to do a drag show to the glory yeah. of God. Yeah, um, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, a self refuting concept. Uh, yeah. And anything of that character, I mean, anything that's that can't be ordered to the glory of God necessarily is death. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think that, that, that interestingly gets on what exactly a sacramental vision of creation as manifesting the glory of God entails. Creation, because it is made to not only enjoy the kind of thing it is, but to enjoy it as the gift it is oriented towards God and other things the right way, right? It therefore participates, when it does so, in the life-manifesting presence of God, right? This is why you can have a piece of music radiate and bring you into the heavens, if you will, right? Um, Because creation, the invisible things can manifest and manifest, uh, the visible things manifest the invisible, but it manifests them in a life-giving way. And when we reject it, we reject the gift of our creation and the moral and created ordering of it towards the glory of God, the life manifesting nature of God's presence. What we bring out is chaos and death, right? I mean, that's, that's exactly what you have going on in Romans, right? When they weren't grateful, they turn to the creature rather than the creator. What happens? Well, the loves get perverted, the mind gets darkened, but the relationships and the, and the social order gets all broken up. And this is exactly right, what you're talking about. In these, these attempts to reject creation and the moral goodness of things um, and try to subvert them, even if you're trying to get a hold of some kind of higher truth in that subversion, you're not embracing something to the glory of God. You're, you're, you're trying to get a hold of something that basically allows you to self-promote in some way. You know, one of the things that this, you know, you, you, when you're talking about the glory of God, one of the things that's interesting is um, in the Gospel of John, um, where he refers to God's glory, what he's really referring to is the manifestation of God's nature or, yeah. or a revelation of God's nature. Yeah. And thus, Jesus is glorified when he goes to the cross. Yeah. 
you know, the, the glorification isn't the resurrection in John, it's yeah. the cross. Because yeah. in the cross, God is revealed in a mind-bogglingly profound way that you just can't get any any other way. A life manifesting way. I mean, that's right. that's what that's what it is. God is li- and this is why the rejection of creation and its chaos and confusion eclipse that life manifest. It's why it brings forth death, right? Um, this is what and this is what kind of Satan wants to introduce into things. Um, it it is it is the, it, it eclipses that life giving manifestation. And mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Now I'm I'm going to take this back to the sacramental world here. Yeah. That because when we look at the creation, it shows. Well, what does it, what do we say? It shows the glory of God. Yeah. You know, you look at, at at the Grand Canyon. You look at the Rocky Mountains. You look at the Northern Lights. You look at you know any of these big and spectacular things, and. Actually, not only those, sunsets, trees, um, all kinds of different things, even the small things in the world, all of them are revelations of something about God, and therefore all of them are manifestations of his glory, Yeah, which then means that the things in this world have meaning beyond themselves. Yeah. As I think I've said umpteen times, it's not just facts, it's meaning. Yeah, and I and I think this is where we are having to rebuild in relationship to the medieval world in ways that, of course, we do now have one advantage. We do have the gifts of the good things given by the sciences that they didn't always have access. So even though they had far more imagination and different ways of relating to those, we do have that aspect. And so what do I mean by that? Well, one of the things you see, like Michael uh, Ward's work, which I think is great, talking about the, the medieval conception of the heavens and, and the way in which, while scientifically, it wouldn't be affirmed by what we know today, in terms of aesthetic and metaphysic, it is much closer to meaning, the, the truth of meaning and reality than our ways of putting together, describing merely the material conditions and the way of putting it together. And this is one of the things Lewis is also brilliantly aware of is that there is more than just scientific, factual-level truth. It is this surplus of meaning worlds that are integrated with that. And he believes even the, 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 the learning of past ways of configuring the heavens and everything else are worth the time because they sometimes capture aspects of the full vision of reality that the current ways of approaching it don't. And so that, that, I think that is very insightful um, that's not something we typically do. We would typically say, oh, that was just the way they thought about it back then. It's outdated. It doesn't have much to teach us. Yeah, that's, uh, of course, the the uh, message behind it, that the discarded image, which was yes. the last published work that yep. we have of his and probably the least read uh, uh, and maybe should be read uh, if you really want to understand everything else he talks about, because yeah, yeah. I don't think you can understand um, the space trilogy or even the Chronicles of Narnia unless you read uh, the discarded image. But that's a really uh, great point, Tom. I think the idea that uh, that something can be discarded as worthless because certain factual points were not lining up with the with reality uh is uh, kind of missing this larger point that you're making with you know surplus the surplus character of reality in other words yeah. uh there's meaning that it, that is uh superfluous so to speak yeah. um it's not just about the material character of reality there's 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 a dimension to things that transcends the physical world and the physical world is actually a reflection of it that's really the message of metaphysics is metaphysics is is that there is a reality that's eternal in character and it's reflected in the physical world and the physical world isn't the basis for our metaphysics the metaphysics are the basis for the way the physical world is ordered yeah and i and i think that the profundity of that point coming from Lewis and figures like that. I mean, we're starting to see the fruit of it now by so much work being done uh, on this, but I think it's so timely 
And with such, you know, such wisdom and insight, Lewis was doing this stuff and, and, and his, his group. Because one of the things you begin to see is that as kind of, you know, with the postmodern world in which reason is looked at basically as a mask for power, right? And of course, you had Rene Girard with, you know, the whole answering of them is basically the whole deconstructive pro- process owes itself sort of to Christianity <laughs> and, the, and ultimately the scapegoat and the innocent, right? Um, but the thing that I think Alison Milbank pulls out is, uh, you know, Girard didn't go far enough uh, and Lewis was far more on track and that recognizing imagination, metaphysics, aesthetics, and perception um, in a much richer, almost owing it to medieval Christianity, um, allows us to address the postmodern world in ways that the old kind of Norman Geisler stuff isn't just, is, is just not going to have a hearing. It doesn't mean that he, Geisler has nothing to say. Of course, there's a place for that. But it's just that the way in the invitation into the Christian vision um, from the Christian sacramental vision is so holistic in that it addresses those aspects of us as human beings that everywhere is crying out, right? Our mimetic natures, our aesthetic natures, our needs from all these things, the meaningfulness of everything we do, even our projects of postmodern deconstruct, all meaning projects. I mean, what is it about us and why is it that we are so hungry and needy and get everything us- about ourselves from these, these, you know, projects of meaning? And, and these things are stuff Lewis was, I think, very, very attuned to. And this is why he could write things like The Four Loves, and he understood the ways that, like uh, Anders uh, Nygren didn't understand that there isn't there isn't a, in Christianity a agape crushing out our eros, right? Um, but yet agape is the fulfillment of that eros, and yes, that eros, all those desires that we have as creatures are distorted and running in all kinds of directions. But they also speak of transcendent yearning to which the gospel is the answer and the God who comes down, you know? And, and I think that that kind of way of approaching apologetics, I think is, uh, is, is onto something in our way of communicating in the very challenging times. Well, and it challenges us um, just thinking about what's required to do that kind of analysis, sorting things out. I think yeah. many people recoil from it because yeah. they don't feel up to the task. But even those of us who maybe feel like, okay, I think I maybe have enough to at least attempt it, know that we can go wrong. Yeah. And there's something intimidating about that. Um, so even as we do it, we have to qualify what we're doing by saying, you know, I don't, I, it's not like I have this fully figured out or yeah. everything I say is absolutely correct. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work my way through this stuff. Now, in the process, we'll lose some people. I mean, I think that's yeah. the danger. I mean, and that yeah. maybe is why some people re- recoil and sort of retreat to a very s- sort of uh, reduced approach, yeah. you know, where um, good, bad. The problem is, of course, is that even when you do that, uh, some really bad stuff can kind of work itself into your very simple um, yeah. bifurcation and you get people promoting kind of crazy stuff in the name of Christ. <laughs> yeah. I won't get into all that stuff right now, but, uh, but just because you've, 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 you've said, uh, I'm not going to read anything that wasn't written by a Christian doesn't mean you're going to be safe. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Well, it, you're, you're inhabiting, as Lewis said, a tiny world and you're going to get suffocated in it. Or if you're, if you're not getting suffocated, something's wrong and, and, and there's a certain closed inness to yourself, um, I think, that, uh, that is unhealthy as well. Um, and, and there is that kind of, you know, navel gazing, as some of them call it, where you're basically always, <laughs> you know, that's as far as your, your, your reach goes. And again, I mean, you know, it's fine if that's, that that's, you know, I don't know if it's fine, but let's just put it that this way. I, I don't know fully the ramifications for someone that, you know, they safety 
this is a whole show in itself, but this whole, well, well, I might as well bring it up. We have a little time. There is this whole move even in the church, much less the culture, to where safety and protection from any kind of challenge or conflict or anything that might make you a little uncomfortable and shake out your kind of certainties. And the thing about my faith is that it's a faith that seeks understanding because it's grounded in in something that is 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 not shakable the eternal nature of god and truth the thing is i am not the eternal nature of god and truth so my own coming into a deepening understanding of that is continuously going to grow as i pursue understanding in faith so, so none of this learning is something that is questioning it's actually a, it's built on my full embrace of that faith. And it is completely my confidence in the incarnation, that God became human in Christ, and that in Christ, the assumption of the flesh is also the assumption of the sacramental vision, if you will, the bringing all things back into conformity to the light, to be able to read the original endowment of creation the right way so we can enact it truthfully until redemption of all things. And so, so, that so really, that, that's yeah, so let, let's, let, let's just mm-hmm. stop there and just think a little bit because I've known parents who have despaired because they sent their kids off to a Christian college yeah, or just a college, you know, it doesn't have to be Christian. And uh, some professor threw them in the deep end of Nietzsche and <laughs> said, read good and e- beyond good and evil. Yeah. And the kid drowned, um, didn't have the faith didn't have the intellectual ability, maybe was a a big fish in a small pond his entire life and thought, okay, I was always the smartest kid in my homeschool group. I can handle this. No. And then they were just crushed, destroyed. I think, I think we have to have a sense as we're working with kids or people in general, uh, for their capacities, for their abilities. Yeah. So I, I don't think like I don't think everybody needs to read everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm perfectly yeah. fine yeah. with uh you know the salt of the earth faith of ninety five percent of the Christian world. Yeah. Uh but uh when you have like zero percent <laughs> <laughs> or less than 1% who are actually able to engage this stuff. So why why do we look back at someone like Augustine with such regard? Yeah. Well, it's because this guy was first class intellectually. Yeah. And now this is another thing that we as evangelicals have, are very uncomfortable with, and that is excellence. Yeah. This guy is not just any guy. Yeah. Um, he uh, intellectually, uh, in terms of his social sort of position was in a different place than 99.99% of the human race. Yeah. Uh, now he could deal with sort of yeah. sorting out Manichaeanism yeah. and Neoplatonism and, and all that kind of stuff. But just because he did doesn't mean the bright kid who got yeah. a 4.0 in, in his yeah. Christian high school with 30 kids uh, is yeah. going to be able to do it. Yeah. Well, that's, and I, and I think that that's the significance of being, if you're involved in teaching as a Christian, as we all are in some way, is that the things we do, on the one hand, we're trying to do constructive work built off the wisdom of Christians who've gone before us, steeped in the scriptures, to navigate the challenges and the peculiar challenges of our time. And to give people, or sometimes just to help people think through it the way we're thinking through it, because we found it helpful ourselves who have had to navigate this in the university all the way up, you know, and into all kinds of arenas. I mean, we've we've been dealing with this stuff in academic work all, all the time. And so ways to think through it and navigate it and be faithful to the riches we have, but also to have the riches come back and actually address the limits of the alternatives that are out there is part of, I think, our witness and contribution. Um, but does everyone need to do that? You know, I, I don't think that's going to happen. And, you know, I think it's another question. How, how do we prepare our young not to fall apart at the challenges of, for example, a university? 
Yeah, and and that's I think one of the key, the key things here. Um, I, I point out two things. First of all, we have the resources to handle every question that's thrown out at us, yeah. but we just don't know our own history. Yeah. You now these things have all been answered. There's yeah. nothing. There, there's not an objection that's come out that's new. Yeah. Um, not not since Aquinas, actually, yeah. probably earlier. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is to be better informed about our own history. But as you point out, this isn't everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, I when I was in high school, I was doing a, uh, I was in the jazz band, and we were doing a. Uh, um, a tour, and we were performing in a Votex school. And one of the guys said, you know, frankly, the people here don't really need Shakespeare. I mean, what are they going to do? Say, forsooth, hand me a wrench? <laughs> you know, I mean, so, you know, the, the, the point isn't that it wouldn't, it would have been good for them to study Shakespeare. Yeah. Maybe, but it really wasn't necessary. Yeah. And we don't really need to be sending everybody off to college. The yeah. ones we do send off to college, we need to equip yeah. properly. And if we can't equip them properly, we shouldn't be sending them to college. Yeah. 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 It, 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 it's, you know, and just the capacity to process things they've never had to confront that way, but really in a, in a, hyper safeguarded mode. I mean, for me, I was thrown into the mix and had to navigate it without any direction. It was, it was really the spirit guiding me to this figure, similar to Lewis in many ways, this figure, then this figure. And I started to see the dead end of so many paths that the, the light of, of the gospel just shone so brightly comparatively. Um, but you know, not everyone goes that way. They kind of start out with, I've got all the answers and I go in and I all of a sudden can't answer any of these, you know, these trendy, fashionable, you know, yeah, ideologies. Yeah. And then, then next thing you know, they're the first ones promoting it, you know, in the church. <laughs> well, or, or many times, and this has been my experience, um, many times they've grown up, in, grown up in environments where they've never really seen a, uh, human being who actually believes these things. Yeah. And what becomes of them until they arrive at college. And then at that point, they see those people at a kind of ideal moment in their lives. They don't see the, the final outcomes. Yeah. Um, those of us who come out of families who are kind of artsy and uh, academically connected and, and, and sort of uh, sort of connected uh, or, or, I mean, immersed um, – we have plenty of people in our families so we can say, I don't want to be like cousin so-and-so or uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so <laughs> or grandma so-and-so. And we say, and they believe this nonsense and this is yeah. what how their lives turned out. And then that provides, provides you with a kind of, I guess, anesthetic. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, inoculation, you could say, a little bit of the disease that makes you immune. Um, yeah. So as I look back at my own background, that's kind of what my background is, is my wife's background too. We've got extended family and we're probably the happiest, pe happiest people in our extended family. Um, yeah. Now we've got artists and, and academics who are uh, well known in their spheres. I wouldn't trade my life for any of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and by the way, the, the flip side also works. When you give a kid a weakened form of Christianity and then they run into it at college, you have inoculated them against it ultimately. Yeah. And and I think, yeah, I think you're right. And this this kind of is you, this is kind of Lewis's point, but applied to, you know, cultivating and training is that here here we tend to focus largely on the moral which is good and great but when it is when we don't have a lot of resources to train their metaphysical and, and and aesthetic antennas for engaging bad metaphysics if you will and cutting off the richness of that morality from the full beautiful vision we have in Christ and creation then we can easily be lured 
by what looks like other pursuits of happiness, right? Even and, and this is, you know, look, we had the aesthetic of the Garden of Eden and we still gave it up for something else, right? <laughs> that better piece of fruit, right? <laughs> we, we so thought, you know. Um, and so, so, and again, there, there is some stuff we have to trust to providence and, and, and you know, the good purposes of, of the Lord. But on the other hand, I think good thing, well, how did Lewis do it? They laughed at Lewis, but he would go do a radio show and he would break this stuff down into ways people in the public could digest it. And he wrote stories. He wrote Narnia. And look at the way in which that has shaped generations. Um, and I think, I think he got it. He recognized that if this is going to be for everyone, um, you have to get it into the stories they're reading. You have to get it into the, the, those things. That doesn't guarantee anything, but it definitely, there's one guarantee. If you don't do something like that, it's not going to enter their worlds. And there we're back again to the importance of imagination. Yeah. Yeah, when it comes to writing those kinds of stories, unfortunately, many uh, people who appreciate Lewis don't actually have much insight into what made him great. Yeah. And they do precisely the thing he said he didn't do. Remember, yeah. remember when he was describing how he went about the process of writing the Narnia stories, he, he didn't begin with, oh, I want to illustrate the atonement or I want yeah. to illustrate this particular vice yeah. He just started with images. Yeah. He had an image of a of a lamppost yeah. and a fawn <laughs> with an umbrella and some packages and yeah. uh, a lion. And, and he just kind of went with that. Now, what can be discouraging about that, of course, is we're not all that gifted. I mean, he yeah. is, after all, a pretty gifted person. Yeah. Um, well, but at least we thing- can't. Go ahead. The other thing, Chris, and this is a point made by Annie Crawford a few episodes ago, what we have today are people who are trying to write Lewis fan fiction or Tolkien yeah. fan fiction right. rather than going back and learning what Lewis knew, yeah. getting the kind of education he had, which is what equipped him to work with those images and develop stories as effectively as he did. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. So, anyway, anything you want to say as we wrap things up here, Tom? I mean, no, I think it's it just a, uh, you know, I was just wanting to build on some of the things we've been talking about and will be talking about more. And I think just some of the profundity um, right. that we've been given in Lewis, the way in which not only he was as an academic and a story writer and, and all of those gifts, um, but the way in which he went about doing these things and the the gift he has given, he has been to the church to help us think through how to approach communicating the faith from its riches in a time where the challenge before us, although not the first challenge we've ever had, is definitely has a certain character to it that we need to start drawing off of some of these rich resources. Lewis already started us down the trail. And rather than just mimicking Lewis, like you said, uh, Glenn, and just trying to do a cheap version of, of what he already did, to really immerse ourselves in the scripture and in the sources of the church, and of course, these rich other sources, to help us invite people to see from the riches that we've been given in Christ. Yeah, that's a great, great thing to say as we conclude this episode. So you've come to the end of the episode and you've gotten to the place where we uh, talk about Indiegogo. So uh, <laughs> you know that we're going to Oxford. We're very excited about that. We're going to be in the kilns. We're going to be at the Bodleian. We're going to be doing a lot of other things. It's going to be a great time. You're going to be interviewing a, d- a number of people. One of the things uh, at the kilns is a pond. <laughs> and that pond is uh, we, we, we've been told uh, a pond that C.S. Lewis would jump into and swim around in. So it occurred to us that... It occurred well, to you. <laughs> <laughs> it occurred to me that it'd be great to have Tom swim in the pond. <laughs> and if you give $1,000 to the Indiegogo campaign... 
we will push Tom into the pond. He might not go willingly, but he will go in the water. Now, if you give $2,000, we will even push Glenn into the pond. But here is the finale. If you give $5,000... I will willingly go into the pond. And if you give us $8,000, we will all go into the pond. And, and, and let, me, hey, let, me, let, me, let me put a discount on this. If you give us $7,500, we'll all go in the pond. Anyway, uh, this is obviously is my idea. <laughs> but uh, on a serious note, if you want to help us out with the, with the, with the, with the show as uh, we're paying for some expenses over there, uh, that is appreciated. And Indigo Go is the way to do it. Anyway, we also have a Patreon account for folks who give to the show on an ongoing basis, and we have a marvelous bunch of people who do that, and you could be one of them. And there are links in the show notes to both the Indiegogo campaign and to Patreon. Anyway, that's enough for now. Thanks a lot, and bye-bye. Bye. The Theology Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. To learn more about the church, you can visit trinityreformedkirk.com, trinityreformedkirk.com.